Welcome to Module 1, A Brief History of Disability. This module will provide us with a historical perspective on independent living and its importance in shaping societal attitudes, defining what disability is, and creating solutions to the issues surrounding disability. The treatment and perceptions of people with disabilities in Western culture have varied greatly throughout the centuries. The early settlers of the American colonies would not admit people with disabilities to the colonies because they believed such people would require financial and other support. Colonists enacted settlement laws that restricted the immigration of many people, including those with disabilities. Regardless of these laws, people were born with disabilities or sustained disabilities after they arrived, although a much smaller number of people survived birth defects or injuries compared with today's modern medical care. During the Revolutionary War, the Continental Congress encouraged recruitment by promising pensions to disabled soldiers. Individual colonies and communities provided as much medical care and hospitalization as possible. During this time, a technique was developed for the amputation of limbs that diminished infection and saved many lives. This technique was the precursor of modern amputation techniques. Throughout history, wars and returning injured soldiers have been a strong motivating factor in advancing more positive attitudes and better solutions, not only of soldiers with disabilities, but of all people with disabilities. The Maryland Hospital was established in Baltimore in 1797 for the relief of indigent sick people and for the reception and care of lunatics. Disability was beginning to be considered a medical issue to be treated by doctors and cured or to be avoided altogether by exclusionary laws. During the 1800s and early 1900s, disability was generally considered the will of God. Religion encouraged people to be compassionate and pitying toward people with disabilities. People with disabilities were expected to be patient, uncomplaining, humble, and to make themselves useful. Living conditions in this era were harsh, especially in industrialized areas for most people, and particularly so for those with disabilities. People who lived in poverty, including a high proportion with disabilities, were often put into poorhouses. Up until about 1920, a primary means for dealing with people with disabilities was to place them in institutions. Some special instructional techniques were also developed, mostly in segregated schools. Approaches were often disability-specific and directed mainly toward groups of people with similar cognitive, visual, auditory, and mobility disabilities. However, many institutions were established for the custodial care of people with disabilities and made no pretense of education. At first, many facilities combined various types of populations. For example, people with disabilities were often housed with prisoners and or impoverished people in jails or almshouses. Later on, the institutions were segregated from regular society based on disability. Most were located in rural areas, away from population centers, and were set up for cure. They often were quite impressive buildings in beautiful country settings. Mouth Magazine published a series of pictures of these institutions, collected by Robert Bogdan, as shown on your screen. In 1841, Dorothea Dix began working on behalf of institutionalized people with disabilities. She traveled over 60,000 miles around the United States to observe and report their living conditions. She found that, quote, more than 9,000 idiots, epileptics, and insane in these United States are destitute of appropriate care and protection, bound with galling chains, bowed beneath fetters and heavy iron balls, attached to drag chains, lacerated with ropes, scourged with rods, and terrified beneath storms of profane execrations and cruel blows, now subject to jibes and scorn and torturing tricks, now abandoned to the most loathsome necessities or subject to the vilest and most outrageous violations." End quote. At the same time, the American School for the Deaf was founded in 1817. It was the first school for disabled children in the Western Hemisphere. 
In 1860, the Gallaudet Guide and Deaf Mute Companion was published, the first disability-related publication. A short time later, President Abraham Lincoln authorized the Columbia Institution for the Deaf, Dumb, and Blind to confer college degrees, making it the first college in the world to be established for people with disabilities. A year later, in 1864, students who were blind were transferred out of the school to Baltimore, and the school eventually was renamed Gallaudet University. The National Convention of Deaf Mutes convened in Ohio in 1880, and the first order of business was to oppose the ongoing effort to suppress the use of sign language in favor of lip reading and oralist communication. People who were deaf expressed their desire to be able to communicate more accurately and rejected the effort to remove deaf teachers from education classes for those who are deaf. This group later became the National Association of the Deaf. The Perkins School for the Blind was established in 1842. Samuel Gridley Howe, the director at Perkins, had previously founded the first educational facility for people with cognitive disabilities. Howe wanted schools to prepare children with disabilities to live with the rest of society. Demonstration of the use of Braille at the Missouri School for the Blind did not take place for 30 more years because of a controversy over, quote, what was good for people who are blind, end quote. This controversy took place mainly between sighted teachers with little input from those being taught. Schools for, quote, feeble-minded youth, end quote, were established in New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and along the East Coast, offering physical training to improve students' motor and sensory skills, basic academic training, and instruction in social and self-help skills. The United States Sanitary Commission, created during the Civil War to provide aid to all federal soldiers, later worked to integrate the soldiers with lingering disabilities back into society. It reported, Quote, as far as possible, invalids should be restored to their original homes and the communities to which they belong should absorb them by assigning to them, by conventional agreement, the lighter occupations and no provisions separating them from their families or diminishing their domestic responsibilities should be encouraged, end quote. The United States Sanitary Commission, notwithstanding its name, set an example for national charities that would characterize American philanthropy for the next century. It was not coincidental that the first wheelchair patent was registered with the U.S. Patent Office shortly after the Civil War ended. It was likely spurred by the needs of Civil War veterans who wanted and required some mobility in their lives. Around 1842, the circus magnate and showman P.T. Barnum began displaying what he called freaks at a special museum in New York City. Essentially, his displays consisted of people with unusual physical features. This practice continued as circus sideshows well into the 1900s. He emphasized differences of those with disabilities in a way that worked against their acceptance and integration into society and certainly distorted perceptions of people with disabilities. Decision-making about the lives of people with disabilities was done by doctors and other professionals as well as showmen, but seldom by the person with the disability. Toward the end of the 19th century and during the first part of the 20th century, a eugenics movement flourished that had an extremely destructive impact on public attitudes toward people with disabilities. Sir Francis Galton coined the term eugenics to describe his pseudoscience of improving humanity. The movement contended that people with disabilities should not be allowed to survive or reproduce because they would weaken the gene pool of the human race and cause all types of social problems and degeneracy. Hitler's Germany facilitated the ultimate abuse for many individuals with disabilities, most notably people with cognitive disabilities and mental illness who were isolated in institutions. They became objects of Nazi medical experimentation and mass execution known as the T4 experiments. The momentum of the eugenics movement led to the passage of laws to prevent people with disabilities from immigrating to this country, marrying, or having children. In many instances, it led to the institutionalization and sterilization of adults and children to protect the human race from degenerating into moral decay.
Indiana was the first state to enact a eugenic sterilization law in 1907. It was followed by 32 other states. The Supreme Court upheld these laws as constitutional in 1927. Scientists eventually disproved the basic tenets of the eugenics movement, but not until after the forced sterilization of thousands of men, women, and children. It is estimated that 60,000 people were sterilized under state laws between the early 1900s and the mid-1950s, following the court's ruling striking down Oklahoma's sterilization law in 1942. In the early 1900s, World War I began to usher in a new era of attitudes toward and perceptions of people with disabilities. Once again, it was a war, World War I, with its thousands of returning veterans who had disabilities and had sacrificed to keep the world safe for democracy that spurred some significant changes and the investment by the federal government of considerable resources to assist veterans with disabilities to find jobs and to find their niche in society. It should be noted that most soldiers who sustained significant injuries did not survive them at that time. The basic medical and charitable models stayed firmly in place. Federal legislation gave further recognition to government's responsibility. In 1918, the U.S. Congress passed the Smith-Hughes Veterans Vocational Rehabilitation Act, creating a program to assist disabled vets to get jobs in the post-war era. In 1920, the Smith-Fess Civilian Vocational Rehabilitation Act was passed to assist civilians with disabilities to become employed. These two pieces of legislation were the forerunners of today's Rehabilitation Act, in which Title VII contains the provisions for independent living. Organizations focusing around specific disabling conditions began to spring up. These organizations were of particular importance because for the first time there were organized efforts to raise money and disseminate information to support the interests of specific disability groups. Most of the organizations were formed and administered by people without disabilities, often parents and friends, acting on behalf of people with disabilities in ways they thought were best, with little input from the people with disabilities themselves. However, there were a few organizations formed by people with disabilities looking out for their own interests. One of these organizations was the League of the Physically Handicapped. It was organized in New York by a group of men with disabilities to stop discrimination by the Federal Works Progress Administration, or WPA. The WPA was developed to help people through the Great Depression years and did not allow the hiring of people with disabilities. The League organized sit-ins, picket lines, and demonstrations. Members traveled to Washington, D.C. to meet with the Roosevelt administration, with the result that the WPA began to hire people with disabilities. This is one of the first times people with disabilities organized themselves to address prejudice and discrimination because of disability. It reflected a change in self-perception and led to the beginning of a change in public perception of people with disabilities. In the mid-1920s, professional and public views began to change once again toward people with disabilities. Professionals began to notice that education, training, and socialization of people with disabilities did make a difference. Over the next several years, institutions began again to develop educational programs with some success, although the number and size of institutions continued to grow with deplorable conditions in many. They were becoming more involved in education and training. Other progress during the years between 1920 and 1960 was evident. The first dog guide school was opened. The first folding wheelchair was devised and patented by Everest and Jennings, which later became the largest manufacturer of wheelchairs in the world. Workers' compensation plans were legislated by 45 states to assist people who become injured and sustain disabilities on their jobs. The Social Security Act was signed in 1935, providing benefits to people over 65 years of age, people who are blind, and to dependent children. The Social Security Act also expanded the Vocational Rehabilitation Act to serve people with mental illness and cognitive disabilities and was made a permanent federal program. President's Committee on Employment of the Handicapped was formed. Self-help groups began to organize but still were based on looking for cures. Congress appropriated funds for grants and loans to veterans to purchase or modify homes to be accessible to those with mobility impairments. 
In 1954, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in Brown v. the Board of Education of Topeka that separate schools for black and white children are inherently unequal and unconstitutional, setting a precedent for considering the legality of segregated education for children with disabilities, and also adding muscle to an impending civil rights movement. The Social Security Act was amended in 1956 to provide Social Security disability insurance for workers who experienced involuntary retirement due to disability. Ginny Laurie, known as the grandmother of independent living, became editor of the Toomey Gazette, a grassroots publication that became an early voice for disability rights, independent living, and cross-disability organizing. The scene was set and the trends in place to foster the emergence of the independent living movement and the disability rights movement. The next module will explore the meaning and emergence of independent living and cover the next phase of disability history in the United States from 1960 to the present.